You might not realize it, but mathematics can unlock incredible power. You can use it to make your dreams become reality. Mathematics is a powerful tool for exploring life on Earth and for discovering our place in the universe. Mathematics is changing the way we play our games, the way we think about ourselves. It's the fuel that's driving the information age. This is mathematics like you've never seen it before. Major funding for this program comes from the National Science Foundation. America's investment in the future. And the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to increase understanding of the application of mathematics in everyday life. Additional funding provided by the McDonnell Douglas Foundation and the Alcoa Foundation with exclusive corporate support from Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments is proud to partner with the education community to create the calculators that help children do extraordinary things. Because the more our children can get out of math and science, the more they'll get out of life. Where's that? Where's that? Uh, on the corner of 21st Street and 5th Avenue. Okay, right. Number 340 on the 8th floor. Yeah, I'll be there, okay? Bye. Every day we communicate with each other about the space we live in. To do this, we need mathematics. It gives us accurate answers to simple questions. Questions like, where am I? In the same way, mathematics lets us describe the space in here, in our imagination. We use it to give dimensions to thoughts and ideas so that what's in here can get out here where we can see it, talk about it, and share it. Mathematics helps us create entire worlds that seem as real as what we see out the window. If we modified that, shift its location so that the front row of seats was like off the front edge and lower, They'll keep, you know, most of the kinematics, all of the velocities, the full ability to move in 3D space. My interest is in movies as an engulfing, immersive experience where the audience gets to actually enter into the movie, become part of the movie. We're giving the human physiological senses, our, our ears, our eyes, uh, our bodies, much more information, and that draws us into the movie like a real experience. Barriers between you and what's on the screen are, are going away. Doug Trumbull's work can be seen in feature films and theme park rides like Back to the Future. His challenge is to cover a two-dimensional screen with three-dimensional images. Images that first come to life in his mind. We do live in our imagination a lot. We all have dreams every night. I know that even during the day when I'm awake and I'm in reality, you know, my mind sort of goes off into some kind of imaginary space and I sort of see images and they're, they're three-dimensional to me. Uh, 
I see things that may or may not exist. Which leads me through my creative process to where ultimately maybe that will end up in a movie or as a prop or something that didn't exist. Trumbull relies on mathematics to translate these three-dimensional ideas to a flat screen. Because well, we're using mistaken, we're not actually, this is not actually awesome. In mathematical form, a dream takes on precise dimension, right. no, which Trumbull well, can saying, manipulate. So point, if we left the vertical axis, the z-axis, the same, and say limited the x and the y to 24 inches, so you still have a full cubic space. On the ride simulator, seats move only 30 inches in each direction. Yeah, you have, you have, but when Trumbull links right. this movement to action on the screen, he creates the illusion of flight. I have sort of a basic intuitive understanding of mathematics and geometry. Mathematics and numbers are behind everything I do. Trumbull's production team uses mathematics in countless ways. With it, they design and build scale models that appear vast to the camera's eye. They combine separate images into one seamless picture. They create computer models that look like the real thing. With mathematical precision, each piece fits together to create a believable reality. When the film is complete, the audience is no longer aware of the movie screen, but seems to fly in three-dimensional space. This illusion of depth is based on a mathematical idea that is centuries old. Before artists understood the geometry of perspective, paintings appeared flat and two-dimensional. In the 1400s, Italian painters discovered a way of giving their vision a new dimension. When the Italians figured out perspective, painting started becoming looking three-dimensional rather than two-dimensional. For me, as, as an artist, I had this revelation that happened to me when I was in art school, and suddenly I understood perspective. And that was revolutionary to me. From each of these little dots down here, draw the orthogonals, that's your railroad tracks, Today, a new generation of students learns to create the illusion of death on a flat surface. Sam Edgerton teaches the rules of perspective by showing how to draw an imaginary room. This is a right wall, this is a ceiling, and this is a floor. Can you imagine this now? In other words, this is no longer parallel to you. It is perpendicular to you. A shoot the shoot. A long tunnel. But nobody is ever born to draw a picture in perspective, which is why it took so long to finally figure it out. One of the things the students have a hard time is seeing the flat piece of paper and imagining it as being an illusion of space, and that they're penetrating the surface and actually moving their eye into deep space as they draw that diagonal pencil line. This is called the vanishing point in perspective lingo, for the moment, VP. The concept of perspective is focused on an imaginary spot called the vanishing point that's directly opposite the viewer's eye. Through this point, all lines running parallel to the viewer's line of sight must converge. When the rules of perspective are followed, any person can visualize any subject in three dimensions. Okay. Oh, okay. You're following the strict laws of geometry, All right. and you're creating a visual image of something you're not even seeing it except in your mind's eye, but it's very rational and 
comports very much to what you would really see in nature when you look into the real world. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think you win this fine, except that oh, you... Okay. Well, let's get a whole guy. In. The rules are simple enough to learn in one hour. But Edgerton believes that the discovery of perspective in Florence, Italy, changed the course of Western civilization. Florence was a medieval city surrounded by a tight wall. And the artist sees these buildings towering up over the walls. And in his mind's eye, he puts these all together in a kind of pastiche of marvelous images with no particular geometric organization whatsoever, just a series of visual sensations which excite him. About 150 years later, we have quite another view of the same city of Florence based on the geometric rules of linear perspective. Notice now that here the artist has really removed himself way up in the sky. In his mind's eye, he fits it into a nice circle. And from this very abstract, very high position, you could actually make a, a very good map. With perspective, artists portrayed not only the spaces they lived in, but imaginary spaces as well. On vaulted ceilings, religious mysteries unfold into infinite space. The advent of linear perspective really mathematize the way we see. The understanding of perspective allows a human being to make a picture of a controlled and, and confined space. It doesn't have to replicate a real space at all. Perhaps that's the real power of perspective. You're not just simply copying nature, you're creating it. Mathematicians begin using perspective to draw shapes and ideas that they previously described with words and numbers. Mathematicians were fascinated by it. Perspective pictures increases the ability to show very complicated polyhedrons, for example, mathematical ideas, which heretofore had to be explained in Latin and in very abstruse language, which only a few could understand. With three-dimensional drawings, people could communicate ideas in a new way. Edgerton believes the use of perspective spurred the growth of technology and industry. Technology was in the guild system where the master would know the technology and then would lay his hands on his best apprentice and bring him into the, into the almost religious uh, mysteries of his profession. And uh, it was all passed down through word of mouth but now what you could do is make exact pictures of a particular device. And that means anybody look at a picture can learn the technique. You made technology available to a broader population than ever before. And this is why the West got a jump on the rest of the world in terms of an industrial revolution. Far more important in the history of Western civilization than the printed word was the printed picture, the printed perspective picture. For more than five centuries, perspective pictures on canvas and film have become the milestones of culture and the bookmarks of history. We today live in an image-glutted society. With every advance of technology, we produce more and more information and more and more images. 
we have had this intense thirst to take what is around us and re-present it. Donna Cox is a graphic artist. Instead of creating imaginary worlds like Doug Trumbull, Cox is depicting cosmic realities for an IMAX film. She is illustrating a mathematical model that describes how two galaxies would collide. I'm really taking information that has already been generated as uh, numbers and use the best tools of our age to communicate it, discovering the pictures and the symmetry and the beauty that's there. Cox collaborates with scientists to help them picture abstract theories and phenomena. I was always torn between whether to major in art or science. And where I really found that things came together was with computer graphics. Ideas sketched in pencil now come to life as Cox moves to the keyboard. Through the computer, Cox can access mathematical tools, including the rules of perspective, to help her picture the galaxies. Art has been mathematized as a result of computers. For those artists who really understand geometry and mathematics can really use the computer to make some very unusual forms. Each galaxy in the model contains a million stars. Computing how gravity affects these stars during the collision creates a massive set of numbers. For almost a year, Cox and her colleagues have been transforming these numbers into pictures. Data is a burden in that we've got so much of it. It's very much like taking 20 pounds of mashed potatoes and shoving it through a straw. And yet, there's a mystery in the numbers. For Cox, the mystery is what the data will look like in three dimensions. To explore this mystery, she will view the data in a tiny theater called the cave. Ooh, that took it down. Now it's filling buckets full of red, green, and blue paint. The galaxy images are projected on the walls and floor. Wake up. When seen through Run stereo it. glasses, they will appear to float in three-dimensional space. Enter, stop. Instead Navigate. of the keyboard, Bob Guide. Patterson navigates computer space with voice commands and a three-dimensional mouse called the wand. Stop, frame, 300, enter. You step into this very dark Key. area and you can actually get massive amounts of data into the cave and you can fly through intergalactic space when you become a part of that data you become a part of that experience to compute the collision quickly two million stars have been reduced to 15,000 triangular shapes There's a lot more points yeah, in there. Let me do a 180 here. And Cox and Patterson explore ways to choreograph the flight of a virtual camera that would document this cosmic event. I think we need to move around a little bit more and like we're being affected by the physical gravitational forces. Where does the universe come from? It's as old a question as probably human beings themselves. Where are we from? Where did this start? There had to be a beginning. We're taking the best data and the best mathematical models available to us today and trying to visualize what it would have been to be there. Created with a sea of numbers, 
The final image captures the drama of a cosmic encounter that would take a billion years to unfold. Across the campus from Donna Cox, George Francis is applying the rules of perspective to another universe, the invisible universe of mathematics. Well, these are pictures of abstract ideas. I started uh, in my drawing lots of pictures to uh, prove my theorems. And as time went by, I found the pictures were more interesting than the theorems themselves. And so I left the theorem proving to people who can do it better, and I do illustration. Like a musician who reads a score and hears the music in his mind, Francis can see a mathematical expression and imagine its shape. I had seen some of the early work that George Francis had done. I said, uh, George, I do computer graphics. You do these wonderful surfaces. Why don't we collaborate and make these images with uh, a supercomputer? The structures Francis draws are called topological surfaces, and mathematicians look for ways to alter their shape without changing their basic traits. Like galaxies ruled by laws of physics, these transformations follow mathematical rules. For example, creasing and cutting holes are not allowed. So it was an interesting mathematical problem. There were these beautiful surfaces that I wanted to be able to visualize. As an experiment, Cox and Francis picked a surface and tried to animate its changing shape. We had no idea what the surface was going to look like once we got an image. After all the, the initial work of writing the code and getting the mathematics into the code, and then we saw this hourglass figure draw on the computer screen. And I looked at the picture and I turned it upside down and said, Donna, look at this. And she said, oh my gosh, there was a rather chaste and somewhat uh, uh, abstract female torso, human torso. We initially said, that looks like a goddess. That looks like a Venus figurine. And the name stuck. But the Venus is a way of taking a surface and watching it really transform and eventually arrive back on itself again. I think we say something is beautiful if it pleases the senses. How can something totally abstract be beautiful? Our mind uh, simply uh, has the same uh, remarkable sensations when uh, something is logically clear and finally fits together and you understand how it works. You say it's beautiful. And there should be another hole over there. No, there's another hole. There's another hole out. You can get out. Okay. I don't know whether this one has a hole. Ah, there's a hole. The it's best a part hole. is to know that I can hole. share information with another human being and that together we can make something that has never been created before. That's Making something yeah. that's invisible, <laughs> visible, is one of the greatest joys that okay, I have. Okay, so now we're looking at uh, one of these new surfaces. Working together, a mathematician and an artist have turned an abstract idea into a three-dimensional picture. But some mathematicians have ideas with higher dimensions. 
dimensions that cannot be seen with the eye. Renaissance perspective gave visual dimensions to abstract geometry. But in the early 1800s, a new geometry emerged that seemed impossible to draw. Then new discoveries inspired people to find ways to picture the fourth dimension. Certainly at the end of the 19th century, we really see a major cultural shift akin to the, the change in worldview that comes with the discovery of perspective and Renaissance space. In contrast, however, to that visible three-dimensional space, there comes to be a great fascination with invisible realities, and certainly the discovery of the X-ray is a major event in this change. This first revelation of, a, of the interior of a hand, for example, caused an incredible uh, reverberation in, in culture at this moment. The popular response is remarkable. Hundreds of articles and books, poems and songs. This is really uh, a remarkable moment that we tend to have forgotten. The discovery of X-rays, radio waves, electrons and radioactivity reveals a vast spectrum of light not visible to the eye. The existence of these invisible realities inspired people to find new ways to describe them. It is a marvelous utopian moment. The kind of feeling, this is a new world, this is a new century, we must have new languages in which to embody it. Uh, verbal languages, visual languages, mathematical languages. Artists are the first to explore ways to picture the invisible. Among them, Pablo Picasso. Picasso says, I paint things as I think them, not as I see them. Picasso does everything to avoid three-dimensionality, to create an image of shifting uh, spaces in which figure and ground seem to merge to suggest a higher reality that is not that of vision but is that of conception. So as part of this turn from the visible to the invisible, the fourth dimension becomes very much identified with the notion of an infinite space. Adventurous mathematicians struggle to depict four-dimensional space. Among them, a Frenchman named Jouffre. Jouffre tries his best to give some sense of the complexity of a four-dimensional solid, creating these see-through views of shifting facets and planes, which are very much limited to the tools available to him at that moment. As this century unfolds, mathematicians continue to explore higher dimensions. But what is needed is someone who can give three-dimensional reality to a four-dimensional shape. It's so simple. Why didn't I think of it before? Del T del X, A minus B squared, square root of T plus X. That's the scientific formula opening a path through the fourth dimension. Now I just walk through walls. That's great. <laughs> Back in 1948, when I was 10 years old, we knew that the world was going to be different. We had uh, revolutions in transportation. Plane travel was uh, readily available for the first time. People had television sets in their homes, and we could no longer ignore nuclear power. It was part of our lives. We knew that our parents and teachers really didn't know very much about this stuff, so we had to go to other sources. So I had this comic book as my guide. In that comic book, a scientist was going into a very futuristic sort of laboratory. This is where my crew is studying the seventh, eighth, and ninth dimensions, said the scientist. 
and the boy reporter had a thought balloon that went up, uh, boom, boom, boom. I wonder whatever happened to the fourth, fifth, and sixth dimensions. Well, I've been wondering ever since. Captain Marvel talked about doing dimensions in a laboratory, but now we actually do do dimensions in a laboratory. In 1948, nobody could imagine computers that enable us to see visualizations of higher dimensions, which we couldn't see 100 years ago when people started doing this in the first place, which we couldn't see back in 1948 or even dream of. Tom Banshaw is a pioneer in visual mathematics. In the 1970s, when computers first had sufficient power, he began to visualize a four-dimensional object called the hypercube. When we saw that hypercube for the first time, we knew we were seeing something totally different that moved in ways that were totally separate from anything we had seen before. And we were utterly taken by it. I realized I'd never completely understand it. The fourth dimension itself is beyond us, as much as the third dimension would be ab above people living on a two-dimensional plane. But it's worth the effort. You'll never run out of challenges, and it will never get boring, as far as I can see. The fluid motion of the hypercube seems to violate the rules of perspective, but its shape can be better understood as being part of a sequence of lower dimensional figures. Imagine a point in space. If we move the point to create a new point and connect them, we create a one dimensional line. If we move the line perpendicular to itself and connect the points, we have a two dimensional square. If we move the square perpendicular to itself and connect the corners, we have a three dimensional cube. If we move the cube perpendicular to its edges and connect the corners, we have a four-dimensional cube, a hypercube. Does the fourth dimension exist? Are there really hypercubes out there? Will we ever see one? And what does the visualization on the computer have to do with some real object? Well, mathematicians actually turn that question around. You can ask whether a square exists. There are no perfect squares, but we all have a conception of a square, and we can recognize a representation of a square, even though we know it's not perfect. The real square is, is an abstraction, something in the mind of God, some of the Greek mathematicians would have said. Mathematical space really exists only in the mind. The world of pure shapes is something which is a mental construction, something in inhabited by perfect points that have no thickness, just location, perfect straight lines, perfect squares. Nobody has ever seen a real cube. So in a sense, a square and a three-dimensional cube have the same degree of reality. But if you believe that, a four-dimensional cube also has that same degree of reality. Because four-dimensional space exists only in the mind, Bankchoff cannot see the hypercube directly. Instead, he observes its projection moving in three-dimensional space. A three-dimensional cube rotating in space creates a shadow that shifts and changes on a two-dimensional surface. Even if we cannot see the cube, we can learn to recognize it by the changing pattern of its shadow. In the same way, Banshaw can study the behavior of a hypercube by watching its three-dimensional shadow. Are there four-dimensional phenomena which we see? Well, I don't know. As a mathematician, I don't ask that question. I can tell you what the object would look like if it did exist without ever asking the question of whether it does or not. If somebody does discover something that looks like this, I'm sure I'll be called in to explain what it's going to do next. And I can show you what it will do next. But that's not why I do it.
One of the advantages of studying higher dimensions is that it makes you much more sophisticated about your own. I see geometry in everything. When I walk down the street, I'm always fascinated by some form. I love seeing patterns. I love looking up and looking at windows and ledges and seeing the, the way different objects fit together, especially if you position yourself in just the right way. Shadows are a great thing to watch. I've always enjoyed watching the moving shadows. We never really see a three-dimensional thing all at once. Even looking at a cube, a block, you only see half of it. And as you walk around it, you have to piece it together. Your problem, if you came into this building for the first time, might be to find my office. But after you've walked around this building for a while, I think you become very familiar with it. You never see it all at once. And yet it is something that is a shape in your mind. So we learn to know a shape by seeing lots of different views and relating them in our mind in some sort of network of associations. By that same sort of process of exploration, you can get to know a four-dimensional shape. I see that again and again with my students over the course of a semester. What I try to do with my students is get them to pay very close attention to what they actually see in three-dimensional space. Speaking as a mathematician, I feel the same way. To take that intuition and try to interpret objects that come from higher dimensional space. It's always easier for me to understand things when I can see them. Well, now you can see them. They're... I remember trying to draw one of them for a final exam. <laughs> yeah, and now, now you don't even have to because we have these real cheap and easy computers that will rotate it in four space and see how it comes back together. I like to go to different churches. And when I go into a church, there's always a great deal of geometry. Of course, that's very distracting. I don't know whether a geometric intuition that comes during a religious service is a inspiration from the Holy Spirit or a temptation from the devil. Geometry is about the kinds of structures and relationships that we can try to visualize and see. We can see some of the same elements in theology or in religion, where we are supposed to treat quite seriously the transcendental realm, a realm that we can't fully see. I do find that the sense of humility that you have to have when you approach things that you know you're never fully able to understand really has a parallel both in my mathematical life and in my religious life. Through a lifetime of work, Tom Bankshaw has opened a window to a higher dimension, allowing us to glimpse shadows of the invisible universe beyond. Chinatown over there, China there, Little Italy there, Vietnam and Singapore down there. The whole world is, is collapsed in upon itself. This is the space we're living in. This is my neighborhood right here. It's my neighborhood. I love it. Five hundred years ago, painters first used geometry to give perspective to the city of Florence. In New York City, another artist uses geometry to give a different kind of perspective to his world. 
I think the main vehicle that uh, artists use to communicate emotion is space. Uh, you could say the history of art is the history of different spaces. And these spaces are an embodiment of the mathematics of the time, of the geometry of the time. But what four-dimensional geometry can do is give you a model of the complexity of the world that we live in. I came to New York in about 69 to be a painter, and I was uh, doing complicated paintings with uh, many spaces in them. But I never really saw the fourth dimension until I met Banshoff. It was though I could plunge my hands through the computer screen and handle this four-dimensional cube like uh, Quicksilver uh, changing and turning inside out. For days, I dreamed only of these images rotating and turning inside out and behaving in these very mysterious and yet recognizable ways. The problem for the, the artist who wants to make art about space is to make space itself present, make space itself visible. This may appear to be diamonds, but I can rotate them to reveal that behind the diamond, really a whole three-dimensional cell was hidden. They can be turned again in the fourth dimension to reveal that they really were sections of hypercubes. For 30,000 years, human beings have made patterns. It's some fundamental way that we, we have to organize and structure our experience. Making patterns can be the ideal way to define space. It'd be nice to just go out and buy a program that does this, but they're not for sale. I had to learn how to write these programs myself. I went back to school to learn computer programming. It was a tremendous task, but I really learned a lot about the mathematics by doing this. The plotter draws on a sheet of paper exactly what's on the screen. And uh, I can use this as a study for a larger painting. To make a larger painting, I photograph these drawings and project it with a slide projector onto a larger screen where I can uh, replicate what the plotter does. Each slide is its own complete three-dimensional space, and many slides make many different spaces in the same place at the same time. And these three-dimensional spaces can interpenetrate one another and can interweave and can overlap each other in paradoxical ways. It's the idea of having mastery over complexity. What the fourth dimension means is being in many spaces at the same time, or having many separate spaces superimposed and yet remaining distinct. I think we have a, a misunderstanding about seeing. We think we see the world out there with our eyes and that this process is objective and automatic. In fact, we see with our minds. We go through life doing geometry. 
You know, Plato said that the gods are always doing geometry. We're always doing geometry. We go through life applying the geometry that we know on our visual world. And if it doesn't fit that geometry, we don't see it. Layering four-dimensional shadows on a two-dimensional canvas, Tony Robbins explores new ways to link the spaces we imagine to the spaces that we live in. A hundred years ago, visual models were not considered real mathematics. The truth was in an equation. It's a great privilege to be living at this time when so much of our high-level mathematics is a visual mathematics accessible to us all. Like generations of artists before him, Tony Robin uses geometry to create space on canvas. But today, other artists are transcending the limits of canvas and immersing themselves in the spaces they create. Seen through video goggles, the virtual reality Marcus Novak explores seems no less real than the room he stands in. Like painters of the Renaissance, Novak creates three-dimensional space by using the rules of geometry. But unlike landscapes with fixed perspectives, these environments can be seen from any point of view. The creation of mathematics and then computers lets me peer into certain aspects of what I can imagine in an accurate way. And it gives me a language by which to notate that and tell you that this is what I'm thinking of. Novak also creates four-dimensional objects more complex than the hypercube. As they rotate in four-dimensional space, Novak can explore their three-dimensional shadows. I think we can never know enough mathematics. I wish I knew a thousand times more. Mathematics is about structures, possible structures. Virtual reality is about visiting possible worlds. Uh, it's, it is the, the mathematical universe, it is the invisible universe, and all our instruments and all our efforts throughout time have been to make the invisible visible. Using mathematics as a tool and a source of inspiration, Novak is creating spaces he calls worlds in progress. The entry world is a large mathematical landscape. You're tempted to, to kind of glide along the curves of this thing and caress something made of uh, one mathematical expression. Every world is connected to every world, and every world is inside every world. There are doorways, they're just cubes, colorful cubes, and you go in them and you're transported to every other world. In another world, you encounter uh, geometric shapes that people have described as birds or bats. I, I think of the Moors as bats, uh, bats of paradise.
it seems to me that if you try to imitate reality, it's doomed to fail because as a replica of reality, it's not very good. Well, I'm trying to find out what new things uh, are possible. I think that's a vast unexplored territory that I think we can venture into and I'm sure come back with incredible uh, insight and incredible beauty. One of the thrills of this is really being able to uh, literally share it with people, to actually you know, be able to say, you know, here, I've made this come inside, and, to, and then to observe their curiosity. I think everyone who makes something at some point is making it because they want to share it. The distance of the eyes is Which, adjustable by you. This side? Both sides. In a classroom called the Reality Lab, Novak shares his worlds with friends and students. Am I free? <laughs> you're free, you're free, you can fly. I think it engages our sense of wonder, and uh, it's, it's alien. Breathtaking. You're a lot brighter. We've shrunken the planet in many ways, and one of the things that this does now uh, is that it allows people to encounter something completely new. As technology continues to evolve, we can immerse our senses deeper and deeper into spaces that we create so that the space one person can imagine can become a space for others to inhabit as well. You could argue that our consciousness itself comes out of our ability to create a pocket of virtual space in our minds that is a mirror of the actual space outside which of course isn't real space, it's space that's constructed of neural relationships, it's, it's, a, it's a mirage. So I can take this mirror of a world which is the seat of my consciousness and put it outside my body in a public realm, I can give it to you to share and you can do that as well. What mathematics does is it gives us uh, a concise and accurate way of sharing them. I think it's absolutely uh, astonishing and beautiful that we can do that. Ten or twenty years from now, we'll look back on these rides and say, oh, they're so slow and boring. You know, let's get going faster. So I don't know, but that media today and all this technology and mathematics isn't in fact part of the process of expanded human consciousness. The Renaissance perspective artist was constantly provoked by his patrons. Give me something more dramatic. I want to see something even more perspective. And uh, we've already transcended that photography now with different kinds of tricky effects in film and so now we're into virtual space and so on and I don't know how far we can go with this. For 500 years, mathematics has been a yardstick that gives perspective to what we see with our mind's eye. It gives structure to our thoughts and ideas, whether their dimensions are simple or complex, whether they are hypercubes or angels. Okay, class, I think we're ready to begin. With mathematics, now, not we have so created a doorway way. to the universe of the imagination. Ideas and inspirations that exist only in the mind can be shared with others and carry forward into the future. To learn more about the Life by the Numbers series, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen.
Exclusive corporate support for this program comes from Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments is proud to partner with the education community to create the calculators that help children do extraordinary things. Because the more our children can get out of math and science, the more they'll get out of life. With major funding from the National Science Foundation, America's investment in the future. And the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to increase understanding of the application of mathematics in everyday life. Additional funding provided by the McDonnell Douglas Foundation and the Alcoa Foundation. To order a video of this program, other programs in the Life by the Numbers series, or the companion book, please call 1 800 274 1307 or write to the address on your screen. This is PBS.